Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to uh, the teachers from two countries. I mean, it's nice to see that there are so many of you uh, with me today. But um, in particular, I want to welcome uh, teachers from Poland, where I come from, and Romania, where I currently live. Uh, and well, without further ado, so that I do not prolong that too much, um, let me start. There are two main questions that I have, you know, that I set for today. The first one is, what do our brains do? Or more importantly, what do our students' brains do when learning? Um, and that's basically, you know, um, the main theme for today. And I think beyond answering this question, is going to take up the majority of that session, of that presentation. Uh, and then I'm going to end very briefly with a comment why it actually matters, right? Why should we bother in the first place to somehow cater to the needs of our of our students? Uh, and to, um, the, a few issues um, appeared in Andre's presentation. A few issues of you know the ones that I'm going to talk about today appeared in Andre's uh, presentation. He did mention uh, such uh, topics as relevance and attention um, and socializing while learning. And I'm going to, I would say, explore on that a little bit, but uh, while the previous session was very much you know, philosophical and general, um, this one is going to be very much classroom specific. So like I said, I am going to talk about similar topics, but what I want to show you today is a bunch of, uh, you know, generic activities to be used um, in the classroom, kind of whichever age group you're teaching and whichever level uh, of uh, linguistic proficiency uh, you're teaching. So without further ado, um, you know, just to engage you a little bit, there are three sentences here about how we learn. Um, and I'd like you to think about whether they are facts or myths. And um, here they are. Number one is we are the best judges of how much we've uh, how much we've learned. And do you think it's a fact or it's a myth? We are the best judges of how much we learned. Myth, 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 fact, myth, fact, fact, myth. Okay. Okay. Most of you are saying that's a myth. Some fact, myth, fact. Somebody gave all three answers already. Okay. Uh, fact, fact. Number, number two, repeated exposure makes future retrieval easier. What do you think that is? Fact, yes, yes, fact. Okay, again, myth. You know, there are so many of you guys that the um, answer just um, arrive at such a speed that, um, yeah, but in general, I can see that the fact is the prevailing answer. And the easier the task, the better we remember the material. What do you think about this one, the last one? Myth, fact, myth, myth. Okay, no way, me, me, okay. okay. I'm glad to, I'm glad to, you know, um, to get various answers because that basically means, um, you know, um, we're all getting curious as to what the actually answers really are. And I'm not going to tell you right away what, uh, what the correct, what the right answers should be. Uh, the answers will unfold as the session goes along. Before we start, I'd like to start with a short video. Um, just take a look. You may open the envelopes containing your papers. The exam starts now. Okay, now, two questions. Has it ever happened to you that you came into the exam room pretty self-confident, you know, being pretty sure you have studied enough to, you know, answer all the questions, and then the moment you see the question, your mind goes blank? Of course, of course it did. 
somebody did somebody write never yes sure yeah of course of course um another thing has it ever happened to you that you know you distribute the mark tests to your students so like a different situation not you as a learner now you as a teacher you distribute the tests marked uh and the students who are dissatisfied with the mark say but i was learning miss i was really learning i spent like two days learning and studying has that ever happened to you of course always exactly now let me tell you what happens here in both of these in all of these situations you know the students who say that but miss i was really learning it and you being unable to re recall or retrieve any kind of facts in an exam or mr bean here they all have one thing in common in the studying process there was nothing or no one to verify whether you have actually learned uh, something or not what you ended up with is a phenomenon called the illusion of mastery or false fluency let me tell you what happens here um very often the way we learn the way we learn ah oh, that's the way i used to learn almost my entire life really unfortunately also the, this is the way students learn um we kind of read and reread the notes we read the notes once and then again and one more time and one more time and by the time we read our notes for the third fourth time our brains begin to recognize what is there on the page so you know you start with take studying vocabulary for a test learning you know a vocabulary list kind of by heart by the time you read this vocabulary list for the fourth time your brain says, ah, this i know this oh, okay I, I know this and i know this because your brain begins to recognize what is on that page and not because you have successfully learned it because my dear the amount of study time is not the measure of mastery it's not about but miss i was learning for two afternoons or i was studying for four hours last night it doesn't really matter you might have been studying you know for 10 hours still without any success okay so come once again are we the best judges of how much we've learned let me look at the chat box. Of course not, right? Of course not. In fact, we get very easily tricked by our kind of brains by that illusion of mastery. We may think that we already know it, but in fact, um, you know, we recognize the information, but we are not able to retrieve them, the facts, or retrieve, recall. Um, and words, phrases at a particular point in time. Okay, then. Changing the subject slightly. Tell me where is the fire extinguisher in your workplace? Whether, whether you work you know, at a university, in an office, in the school. Have you got any idea where the fire extinguisher is? Corridor, exit area. Don't remember. Nope. Of course, no. No, no corridor. Everybody says corridor, but would you be by the door? Okay. Hall somewhere. Okay, let me tell you this. Mm -hmm. By the door at the university. <laughs> this is a very nice answer. Somewhere at the university. That's pretty sure. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty honest. And um, it's 100% um, you know, true. Now, let me tell you this. I didn't realize where the fire extinguisher was until we had a fire drill. And the guy who was running, you know, the um, uh, um, safety um, kind of presentation or safety workshop asked us exactly the same question. And no one in the room could actually answer, right? Well, it turned out that I was passing that fire extinguisher several times a day kind of every time I was going out of my office and then back into the office, I had to pass, like, like pa walk past the fire extinguisher. The problem is no one has ever, I never paid attention to it. I didn't bother, okay? And without paying attention, right? Without, you know, acknowledging certain facts, without some active involvement and engagement, the brain, my mind, I didn't even, I didn't even um, acknowledge the fact. 
So is repeated exposure enough to be able to retrieve some facts and knowledge in the future? Of course, no, right? The repeated exposure is the exposure alone is not enough. There has to be something more. And we're going to get back to that more in a moment. Okay. And now one more point that I'd like to make is uh, the following. You've got three different tasks and three different instructions here. Which of them is the most difficult? Oh, can you rank them from the most from the easiest to the most difficult, please. What would be the order? You can type it, you can just think about it. What is three to one, three to one, two, okay. Again, most of the answers are the same and they are as follows, right? The easiest will be read the text and circle the correct words. Why is it the easiest? Because the options are there, they are given. All the work all the learner needs to do is choose. Then complete the gaps and sentences with the correct words. You know, kind of, you have to figure out the meaning and recall or retrieve the form, which makes, but the context is there, right? You only, all you need to do is figure out the meaning that you need and recall or retrieve the form. Now in the last one, this is a completely different story because what you really need to do is come up with a context on your own, okay? This, the processing demand behind this particular activity is incomparable to, uh, to the other two. And the way I see it, the words or vocabulary, any vocabulary items that we are trying to teach once they are used in the story created by the learner, they will be the most memorable because this is where the biggest workout or the biggest challenge for the brain is, right? In other words, extra effort or a challenge for the brain, some kind of workout, putting effort into the task leads to deeper storage and stronger, uh, deeper storage and retrieval strengths. In other words, this is the activity which actually helps you remember the language that you are learning. Or in other words, this is the activity that helps your learners remember the, the language that they are learning. Now, let me show you an example. This is a, um, it's um, from a course book that I uh, once wrote several, um, several years ago, really. And, it kind of, it combines different activities, you know, putting uh, the words into categories. There's some reading, there's um, um, students have to read a short text and circle, uh, um, circle the uh, correct words. And then at the end of the page, there's like a tiny little, tiny little tasks, which asks students to create a text using the words from the lesson. I'm showing this to you for a particular reason. Because usually this is the task that gets to, gets to be omitted when you're running out of time during a, lesson, during, a, during a lesson. You know, it's usually the last one on the page, especially that it's so short and tiny that, you know, we have a tendency to skip. Well, not always, but you know, in terms of time management, it's I think one, like it, it's an easy decision to be taken, you know, on the spot uh, impromptu, so to speak. Yet this is the task, the, the way I see it, that carries the biggest processing demand and hence will make students remember the material from this lesson the best because it makes them think the hardest. So coming back to our list of myths and facts, is it true that the easier the task, the better we remember the material? Obviously not. If we wanted to paraphrase, if we wanted to paraphrase it, the more difficult the task, the better we will remember that. And let me now, at this point, uh, refer to what Andre uh, said uh, in the previous session about cognitive load. Because um, what I'm trying to show you here is that in a moment that 
in fact, uh, for any learning to take place, so when learning or in order to in order to learn, the brain has to make effort, which kind of seemingly stays in a position to what Andre said about cognitive about the cognitive load. Let me explain it right now so that uh, there are no doubts about how these two concepts re um, relate to, uh, to each other. The cognitive load is more is like about how much students learn, how many words they have to learn. So co the cognitive load is more about the amount. What I'm talking here today is not the amount, so not the quantity, but the quality. So my idea would be, okay, the cognitive load can, can be reduced. What I'm interested in is the cognitive depth, not how much we teach and how much we expect and how much students learn, but how kind of, how deeply we dig into that, uh, in that particular, um, you know, area of knowledge or language in our case, right? So, here is the, 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 uh, the answer to um, the first of two answers to our main questions for today. When learning, what does the, the, uh, what does the brain do when it, it is learning? Well, it definitely makes effort, right? And if we really want the learners or the brain to make effort, we need to promote the so-called deep processing, right? So it's not about how much, but how deep kind of going into, it's in other words, making students think harder or think more, okay, about a, a structure, about a vocabulary set, okay? And there are two uh, ways in which we can promote that deep processing. After Scott Thornberry, uh, uh, to, whom, uh, to whom I'm going to relate in a moment, again, uh, there are two types of deep processing. One is cognitive and one is affective. The cognitive means that students have to involve extra, you know, um, ex some extra thinking skills, right? While doing the task. So it kind of, the task challenges them cognitively. So they have to think more. When a, when a task um, is deep, in, involves deep processing in terms of affect, <coughs> sorry, it makes students feel and talk about emotions and experience some kind of mm, joy in a way. Let me now show you what it means on the basis of this continuum. Like I said, uh, um, um, the continuum or like a map really uh, suggested by Scott Pondbury in his book, How to Teach Vocabulary. <clears throat> Generally, he says that in terms of the depth of processing, uh, all the activities can be either cognitively demanding or undemanding. And that's the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the vertical line, okay? Cognitively demanding, meaning cognitively difficult, academically difficult, involving some extra thinking skills. <laughs> if you just excuse me. And then on the other side of the continuum, we have activities that are cognitively undemanding, right? Like meaning downright easy, right? Not requiring any extra thinking skills. In the horizontal uh, line or the other continuum, we've got activities which are either effectively unengaging, which, you know, they don't engage any emotions. They are kind of, there is nothing about the student, no emotions, no personal feelings um, are involved. And this is juxtaposed with activities which are effectively engaging. These are the activities in, in which students you know, talk about themselves, bring their own emotions. They can decide what they like, what they don't like. And now in order to show you how all of the activities that in the uh, classroom that, uh, uh, we usually do, can be put in different places on this scale, okay? Now, let's imagine that we are learning a vocab, well, we are teaching, I'm sorry, we are teaching a vocabulary set. So we are talking about certain, I don't know, let's say 
10, 12 words that we want to teach on that particular lesson. So now, if we tell students to put them in an in alphabetical order, as you can imagine, this is co like, it's completely unengaging because there is absolutely no fun, no emotions, no affect involved. And to be honest, this is not particularly difficult, okay? There is no extra thinking involved. When we ask students to listen to the words as you say them out loud and repeat them, just as the first one, this is rather unengaging. I mean, there is no kind of fun in doing that activities. There are no emotions, nothing personal comes in. And again, they are rather cognitively undemanding. Students don't even need to um, you know, know what the words mean to be able to repeat them. Number three now, make questions with these words, you know, those 12 words that are our target lexical set for the lesson and ask your partner. Now, there is some extra skill involved, some extra thinking because we students have to put the words into the context of a, uh, of a question. However, it's just, you know, we ask, we just ask the questions, there is no, you know, interaction involved. So no affect will be, uh, you know, engaged, involved in this activity. Now, number five, make sure, uh, sorry, make, uh, sorry, number four, put the words on a scale from I like the most to I hate. And this is when students can start talking about their own feelings. Let's say that the 12 vocabulary items are food related. Students' task is to write what they like the most, what they like the least or what they hate. And this is, ex this is an extremely engaging activity. Okay, because students find, are finally allowed to talk about themselves. However, it's not that demanding because all students do cognitively, academically is rewrite the words. Number five, make sure, make true and false sentences with these words again. Can your partner guess which ones are true? And now, first of all, we have to make sentences, which is cognitively, obviously, demanding. At the same time, uh, you know, you make a riddle for your friend trying to, uh, you know, trick him or her, which what is true, what is false, the other student in the pair has to guess. So this activity is both cognitively demanding and effectively engaging. And as you can figure out, these are the activities which have got, which make the brains make the biggest effort in other words, make the language learning more effective or make the language that we teach the most memorable. We have one more task here and it's number six, translate the words. This is always very controversial, so I left it till the end. Because generally um, we think we, I mean, translation is difficult, but as in translating sentences, Translation as a form of, you know, introducing or practicing a vocabulary set is not only unengaging, but also undemanding. I'm talking about translating kind of word for word uh, in the lexical set that we are currently introducing. Then the task is undemanding. So like I said, what we are aiming at in the language classroom are the activities that are both engaging and demanding. So the one thing, to, you know, one way of making, this is one way of making students' brains make effort, okay? Another way is to engage them in activities which make students think more or think harder. Let me show you how that works. One of my favorite uh, activities in general, this is, an, uh, this, as you may, this is the kind of vocabulary set that we are working on and, um, so basically 10, 11 year olds, I would say, and you know, an activity that everybody knows pretty well, that is the odd one out, right? Now, the odd one out, mind you, there is no good or bad answer here. So whatever students say and can explain properly will be acceptable. So students, we can say that it's a school bag because I don't know, there is no E, uh, let, there's no letter E in it or it's a school bag because there is everything else can fit inside uh, 
or it's a pencil case because that's the only one with two words. The big, the actual effort comes when we ask students to choose another one out. Okay, and this is okay. So the first is all the first is easiest. First, the first one to choose is the easiest, but as we said before, it's not the easiest task that makes students work harder and learn better, but the more the, the more uh, demanding an activity, the better they learn. So to make that activity more demanding, let's ask students to choose another one out. Let me show you how it works on the basis of a different set, not a vocabulary set, a kind of grammar set. Um, and I have a question, which of these would you say is the odd one out? Couldn't, won't, doesn't. That's very interesting because I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you can actually, um, you know, explain that. Um, I chose a different one. For me, the odd one out is can't because that's the only one that is spelled together as one word. And now the question, uh, the next question is, so what is another one out? I would, to be honest, I would use isn't because won't, couldn't, and doesn't are followed by uh, a verb in uh, its basic form. Isn't is either is followed by either a different part of speech or we need a different, uh, we need a different form of a verb, okay? That's my explanation. Again, if students can do something else, this is fine. See, the answers that you're typing, like, I completely, I, you know, everybody's typing in something different. So, but like, again, it doesn't really matter what students do. What matters is, first of all, we make them think twice, which means that we make them think harder. And also the most important thing in this task is that students um, are able to explain. So this is the effort. This is the cognitive, um, uh, the extra processing demand that we can, uh, ask students to um, then then we, that we can give to our students another way of making um, of making students make extra effort is elaboration that is we can ask students to explain it whatever it is to somebody else and this is a great idea for power work look at this let's say that you work with um, uh, um, Okay, model verbs, grammar. This is a grammar lesson, okay? In order to make sure that students really understand and they make extra effort, ask students to read the rules and explain that, those rules to their friends. That might be in L1, that's okay. The most important thing is the following. In order to explain something to somebody else, first of all, you have to really understand it first. Okay, and then your brain makes extra effort, thanks to which the things that you are explaining um, are memorable and you remember them better and for longer. Uh, by the way, and this is like a kind of a digression really, uh, one of the best ways to make our brains make effort uh, is to study in pairs or in groups. I'm not sure if you did that, in the during your studies to be honest i didn't because i always thought that you know i would be uh better off just on my own in silence and so on but if you study with somebody else you earn there are two extra benefits first of all your brain makes effort because you at least occasionally have to explain what you're studying whatever you're studying to your friend Okay, if he doesn't understand or where you want to, you know, go over the material, you have to say what you've just read in your own words. And secondly, you've got a, you've got a person to quiz you on that, on whatever you're learning. In other words, you don't have to be the judge of how much you've learned because you've got somebody else. And if you remember from the beginning of that session, um, you know, um, we are not the perfect, we are not the best judges of how much we've learned, right? So there's a judge for us to verify if we have actually learned something or not. So when learning, when learning, we already said that the brain has to make effort. But there is one more, I would say, caveat enter here. Let me just look at the um, our clock. 
uh, the brain is very selfish when learning. In other words, if we don't convince the brain that it is worth that it is worth making effort, it won't. Okay. One of the um, one of the um, um, scientists and researchers in, in the field of neurodidactics, Dr. Zelinska, once wrote that you know you come to the classroom with 20 students and you have basically five minutes to convince 20 different brains that what you're about to teach and what they are about to learn is actually worth making effort. So what do we know? What do we do to show our learners an immediate benefit? Let me show you how important uh, this immediate personal benefit actually is. I can easily uh, imagine an 11 year old boy a fan of football who will easily, you know, remember all the Premier um, League uh, tables by heart and compare them like season to season. But when he is expected to learn a, li um, a list of irregular verbs by heart, this is when the problems begin. You know, why? Because irregular verbs are rather meaningless and there is no personal benefit. And there's nothing in the irregular verbs list that an 11 year old might find interesting uh, about, as opposed to obviously football and, uh, and statistics. So now, what is it that makes words or a word or vocabulary item or the language that we learn in general more memorable? I would say there are three elements. The language has the language right, has to be meaningful, or the task has to be meaningful, emotional, and personal. And obviously, we cannot talk about, you know, speaking of 11-year-olds, we cannot, you know, make every lesson about, I don't know, Harry Potter, Tom Holland, and, uh, uh, you know, football, right, obviously. There are, however, some tricks that we can introduce or that we can make the language and the task meaningful, emotional and personal. And let me show them to you very briefly. The first one, obviously, to show students immediate relevance, the relevance that Andre talked about uh, uh, in the previous session. If we introduce a set of everyday activities, uh, ask students to um, put those activities in the order with and with the times that they are uh, in which they do it in uh, their personal lives. We kind of show students immediately that, you know, the language they are learning is not just for tests and exams, but actually for everyday communication. Another example, look here. If one of the vocab, the, the sets that you're introducing is fill in a form, right? Why not asking students, have you ever filled in a form? Right? And the student who uses this in communication, trying to communicate something about himself or herself, uh, will definitely remember that particular vocabulary item longer, for longer, and better. Okay. Another example of making the language more, you know, personal and meaningful is making or telling students or helping students make to make their notebook. Uh, they are using mm, truly personal. Now, how do we do that? Look, when, you, when we open a typical notebook, it's usually, you know, full of word lists, right? With the English word and the Polish equivalents, which is kind of, you know, meaningless and definitely not fun and far from personal because everybody's notebooks look, uh, notebook looks the same. If, however, we ask students to write the words in the way that you know, illustrates a particular concept, something that you know, um, students have to think about. Okay, so what do I do? How do I write steps? So how do I write toes? You know, there is some extra effort involved in this. That's one thing. Secondly, every single notebook is different and personal. Let me show you other examples. You know, you don't need to have particular drawing skills to do that. Look, the straight hair, can you see it? The mouth. And this is, you know, um, this is a course or this is a task really for 10 year olds. Another example will be here. You know, change or write the uh, words in the shape of, uh, in the shape of, you know, that particular object like sticky tape. Uh, here. 
Another example of making the language meaningful, um, emo and meaningful and emotional, the, the activity here uh, uses very basic language with you know, giving students age and hobbies and uh, the verbs to be, have got, has got, and present simple, but change it like uh, to, to make riddles, right? And um, to make riddles. Uh, so there are five friends, Jimmy, Sue, Frank, and Joe. They are 10, 11, 12, 13, and uh, their hobbies are cycling, tennis, and so on. And based on the seven sentences, the student's task is to figure out how old each person is and what their hobbies are, okay? Uh, and again, this is not perhaps, this is not personal, but because it's like, oh, there's a riddle, right? Students do the task with much more curiosity, much more attention, and therefore their brain is willing instantly to make bigger effort. And one final activity which makes the language that we teach more, per more memorable and more personal, this activity is taken from Nick Billsbro, Bill Pro, uh, it's called associations. In this activity, okay, in this activity, students write the name like uh, of someone who this activity, this particular uh, task is uh, for introducing or pra actually practicing personality adjectives. Students' task is to write the names of the people without writing the adjectives, and then based on the names, they have to retrieve or recall. These, uh, these adjectives. Mind you that the task can be easily adapted to uh, lower levels. For example, write the color of your rubber, pencil, school bag, sharpener, pencil case. And again, students write only the colors. And then, you know, based on the colors, they have to retrieve this uh, or retrieve or recall this particular set. Okay, so this is it, basically. We talked about what our brain does when learning. It makes effort and it is very selfish in that effort, right? And now the final question, like why it matters? And very briefly, uh, in order to uh, you know, tell you why it matters, let me just quote uh, Spitzer here. What do you think is missing? The student's brain is the teacher's what? What do you think about it? Canvas, ooh, very artistic, challenge. Playground, this is, it's the second actually time today that I've had this uh, uh, session and somebody also wrote that. Uh, and it's almost, almost what I had in mind, uh, what, sorry, Spitzer had in mind, student's brain is the teacher's workplace. So I guess this answered the question why it actually matters, because at the end of the day, it is our job and this is where we kind of work. And this is it for me for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And sorry for being a little bit, doing it for a little bit longer than I was supposed to. <laughs> no problem. You're doing it like a naughty child. You just went like a naughty student for a second. Okay? Yeah, 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 because, yeah. I no usually, I, I like to keep, you know, uh, my, my, my time management proper. But, um, yeah. No worries, no worries at all. Thanks a lot, Carolina. What an amazing session. Really, really helpful. Really, a really grounded session, really helpful session. Thank um, you. Any questions? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um we've had quite a few questions. So one question that stood out to me actually is, I mean, it's an obvious question from what you were saying. So the overall message that I've gleaned from your talk, one of several, but the main message for me was. Uh, challenge your students, don't make it too easy, make sure their brain is working for that learning, for that piece of, for exactly. that memory to be built, right? And mm -hmm. um, with that comes the obvious question of, you can't push them too hard, right? You know, you push a car too hard and it will break. You, you push anything too hard and it breaks. Uh, we're not saying the student's brain is going to break, but they're going to maybe give up. They're going to stop or their motivation is going to stop or they maybe mm -hmm. feel they can't do it anymore because they've tried too hard. What's your response to that? I think that... Uh... You know, pushing, pushing too hard is about expectations. With these ideas, my, the expectations of the teacher do not really go up at all. They just, the expectations are exactly the same. With making students' brains make effort, I'm actually helping my learners to, you know, deal with, the, with what they are supposed to learn. 
So it's not that my expert pushing the way I, I understand pushing too hard or pushing students will be to raise expectations to give students more. All of these, all the idea of brain friendly teaching is uh, about helping learners to deal with the language that they have to deal, right? I'm not kind of expanding my expectations. I'm just channeling them uh, and putting them in the right direction. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does, it does. Yeah, thanks, it does. Um, so I'm aware that we've we've run over and I don't want to take people's time. I don't want them to feel they need to stay here, but when they've got, uh, teachers are busy, you, you know more than anyone kept counting. So we're gonna call it call it a day there, I think. Um, okay. So just wanted to say again, thank you so much. You've still got another session today and you're in yes. uh, Romania, right? So that's like, a, that's like a midnight session for you tonight, isn't it? It will be a midnight session, sure. So thank you, thank you for delivering it, and I think Thank let's give you. you a bit of a break. And Bye -bye. yeah, we'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.